Hi everyone and welcome to today's art chat from Brush to Palette Knives. My name is Sarah Alsfall and I will be your moderator and um, host for today's webinar or art <laughs> chat. We're kind of switching things up a little bit here today and Linda is going to be the guest on her very own art chat. So I'm very excited to hear about everything Linda's been doing. I'm Facebook friends with you and I always see all the cool things you're up to so I'm really excited to get into this today, Linda. <laughs> Um, and I just want to invite everyone, if you guys have questions, to type them into the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel, um, and I will ask those on your behalf to Linda. Everyone is muted, and that's just so we don't get noise from your end, so please type your questions into that question section. And if you have any technical questions, I'll try to get to those too, but hopefully everyone can see the first slide in here, myself and Linda. So welcome, Linda. Um, these first slides here I have, um, let's are your new book. So why don't we just kind of tell, why don't you tell me a little bit about that right off the start and then um, we'll get into some of these other questions I have here. Okay, that, that'd be great. Thanks um, everyone for joining us. Um, as I posted in, a, in my Facebook Artist to Creative Entrepreneur group, um, I am not used to being on this side of the microphone. <laughs> I am so used to being the one asking the questions and not answering them. So, um, you know, feeling your love for showing up and, and listening to this. This is this is really great. Um, and hopefully, you'll find this talk really really inspiring. And uh, it, please do ask any questions uh, that you have. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'll try and answer them the best I can. Uh, the first uh, slide that we have here is the the newest book. And I'm really honored and like over the moon happy that this book is really taking off over at Amazon. I had a lot of pre-orders at the beginning um, off on my website. It was the um, I did like a 99 cents pre-order, and then I had another um, regular price to your so it's 3.99 um, off of my website where I will send it to you personally with a note, or you can order it off of Amazon. And over at Amazon right now, Amazon Kindle. Um, I was really excited uh, to find out that it is number one in the hot new releases area over at Amazon, oh. and I'm on. I know, and I, like that. What that happened like last night? <laughs> I wow. figured this. I just I didn't get to sleep until four in the morning, so I'm kind of you know a little weird today because <laughs> I think I only got about four hours of sleep. But um, anyway, the it's number one in hot new releases. It's number um, eight in the painting best-selling area and then I think it's number 15 so in the oil painting area but last night wow, I was actually on the front page with, yeah of, of that with um, with Kevin being Kevin's books being up there and John Carlson's books being up there I'm like oh wow man what an honor to be with you know my mentor number one and and number two the, to be up there with John Carlson's guide of landscape painting it was which I reference in the book uh, a number of times so yes yeah, so that's been really really <laughs> exciting and and um, yeah, it's a, I'm just so happy that everybody's finding this book useful. And and um, like I said, it's only priced for $3.99, and you get uh, close to 200 and I think it's about 235 pages and over 179, about 175, 179 illustrations in the book um, to work from. So lots of information from painting to marketing. Wow. Okay. So. I think we have the table of contents here. So here's a little peek at everything that's in there for you guys. Um, right. Yeah. It's it um. It it's really kind. Of, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of. It's kind of. But this is a JPEG that I took of the of the front cover to to share. And I share it on my website as well. Um, but basically. Uh, We'll get into this more when, when we start talking uh, the questions, but we start out with some key foundation elements that make any painting great and absolutely have to be there if you want to paint a masterpiece. And um, then we go into slowly adding and discovering uh, what you can do with just black and white paint called value studies, <laughs> and then we go into adding color. and. Uh, a lot of this, and then uh, talk about edges and different things like that, because those are all still important and finishing touches. So this is a step-by-step -step process, and this is what I teach um, when I do workshops or when I um, uh, teach in class at uh, Middletown Art Center. And of course, we have over at uh, Artist Network University, there's the online course um, from brush to palette knife. And I know there's going to be some um, 
revamping going on over at the website, so I'm not sure that won't be available until like January. But if you have any questions, just drop me a note. But it's um, definitely it's taken me years to re refine this process, and and putting it down in book form has really really helped too. So a lot of information uh, in this book, and like down to marketing your art, the materials I use, um, more helpful art skill articles that are in there and then I used to write when I had a lot more time I used to write art chat summaries um, of, of shows that really impacted how I was thinking or uh, affected how I was thinking and uh, I included those summaries as well hmm. um, in there. Very cool. Well it sounds like it's filled with great information and I hope everyone will pick this up over at Amazon. What a good deal. <laughs> All right, so now we oh, there's move my on. <laughs> yeah, I have a bunch of your art here that I'll just kind of flip through, but I really want to get into asking you some questions here, and um, sure. hopefully everyone can just enjoy this in the background, but if you see one specific that you want to talk about, obviously you can interrupt and talk about the art on the screen as well, Linda. Um, but let's get started. Let's okay. start at the beginning. Um, let's, you know, <laughs> tell me about your art journey. When did it start? How did it start? You know, let us know. Just start from the beginning for us, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. And um, we'll do an abridged version because I, I don't think um, <laughs> we have, we don't have all day. <laughs> okay. I okay. started at like everyone else. You know, we were we were so creative as children, and and we just did not have, um, you know, and people never said this when we were coloring or whatever. Well, maybe some people told you to stay in the lines, but <laughs> I didn't listen to them either. But um, you know, we color and stuff like that. But the weird thing was, is and I was, I remember back in third grade. I remember I was so happy this this tree that I drew with crayons in the art class. And um, my brother, who was in seventh grade or eighth grade, came in, and I was saying, "Look at all the trees!" And he's like, "Yeah, this is cool. Which one's yours?" And I pointed to the one that had the tree trunk. You know, it was a cylinder, and then I had these branches. And then on every branch, I had drawn one leaf next to another leaf next to another leaf, where everybody else had these nice cylinder and spheres, and a couple had branches inside the sphere. You know, I had I was seeing way too much detail, so <laughs> I'm drawing this leaf. And of course, he had to make fun of that. My brother made fun of it, and that's when I kind of went away from being the visual artist or seeing visually mm -hmm. to starting to write. Um, and I, as a kid, I, I wrote, uh, I can remember writing with crayons, like a color real quick, and the next thing you know, I'm trying to write words at the top of the painting, or the top of the page. And um, I, got, I got to the point where um, I just wrote more than I, I drew or, or painted, and it, it just seemed to click with me really, really easily, just like we hear all the other masters say that when they start painting, it, you know, it really just clicked with them as well. It does not, not saying that we had, you know, we definitely had things that we needed to learn through our process, but, um, and I still would color occasionally, and um, in high school, um, my friends and I would sit around and, and write uh, spoof scripts. So Star Wars came along, and uh, we wrote um, a spoof on Star Wars, and then we had a spoof on Flash Gordon, and then we had a spoof on Star Trek the next uh, the motion picture or, or even the series. And then we had one where we pulled it all to, pulled them all together. We had all the good guys in the universe against the bad guys. So you had you know Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and uh, Fla uh, Flash Gordon and Prince Baron and um, James T. Kirk and you know all these guys on one side and then on the other side we had Ming and Darth Vader and the Emperor and, and all and so we had like our universes all came together <laughs> and we wrote a spoof on that and, and had a great time with that and um, it was really kind of funny because all James T. Kirk would do is run in and go, fire the phasers, <laughs> photon torpedoes <laughs> in the background. So it, it was, and we started to film these and stuff. So I had a real big interest in going out to USC and joining their film school. And um, my parents didn't have the money for that. And I certainly didn't have the money for that being 18 years old. So I started working at Procter & Gamble at, at, at 18. I decided that if um, I couldn't go to college, for film, I wasn't going to go to college at all, and so I, I joined or was hired by Procter and Gamble uh, as a technician, which is a, a non-management position. And uh, I remember being in the HR room, HR department, in, during the interview, and the the guy asked me where he saw where I saw myself in five years, and I said, you know, well, this is this has got to be a trick question. 
you know, because I mean, we're talking about testing toilet paper and, and paper towels on, you know, machines. So I basically came back with, well, I see myself managing some projects and, and some people in five years. And he said, that, that will never happen because you don't have a college degree. And I said, well, we'll see. And <laughs> I worked there for 26 years. Wow. And um, moved from, yeah, moved out of the physical test properties to lab and into a, a more technician type job where we started doing products research. And I could just feel the creativity being sucked out of my body. And I mean, it was just, it, they wanted you to be creative, but they wanted it in creative problem solving, not so much like creating. And, and you, there was, was an opportunity where you could create products and things like that, but it was just a totally different type of creativity. It was something that I wasn't interested in at all and, right. and in fact struggled with for the first 10 years because I mean, it literally just sucked me dry. <laughs> and I remember mm -hmm. coming home on Friday night and you know writing all night into 3 or 4 in the morning and then getting some sleep oh, wow. and getting up and, and, and writing again. And that's where Blind Influence actually came from, um, the, which is my fiction novel that's out there. Um, is that's when I started writing Blind Influence and then I wrote a script for Star Trek The Next Generation and sent it off and it was rejected and then um, to, to make this more abridged I was when I was in my studio painting one day and I looked over and there was this manila envelope sitting there and I thought what's this and I pulled it out and it was that rejection so I reread the um, I reread the, the rejection letter from Eric Stilwell, who, if anybody out there are Star Trek fans, um, you'll know that that's a, a pretty big name. And he did everything in that letter to encourage me to write my script over, to meet their submission guidelines, and even had um, literary agent names circled and handed those to me. I, I, everything was there and I was just a oh. stupid kid and didn't realize what he was doing and just yeah. threw it all back in an envelope and, and said oh, you know I, I'm not a writer because I got one rejection <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and so I you know I kind of put that away I every once in a while started working on blind influence again but um, pretty much put that aside and one day uh, I decided that I was going to take a painting class uh, down at the Middletown Art Center and then I lived for every Thursday night from that point after because that was where I could unleash a lot of my creativity um, and was learning to paint under a wonderful instructor by the name of Larry Dowd and um, painted there for a, a long time under Larry until he passed and then uh, in 2005 I decided that I really couldn't put up with PG <laughs> anymore. I needed to be out there and be a painter or be creative. I needed to be doing my own thing. And mm -hmm. um, there were some other circumstances that happened on the other side that I, don't, I won't get into, but um, we made it possible for me to actually resign from P&G after 26 years. And I did make it to the manager ranks. I w and when the time when I left, I was managing projects and I was managing people. So. Mm -hmm. Proved everybody wrong, so yeah. yay for me. But but I also accomplished what I wanted to do, accomplish at PNG by showing the HR director that I could do this, and mm -hmm. um, went into to painting full time. Um, held an exhibit at the Middletown Art Center for Kevin McPherson. That's how I met Kevin, and um, Kevin and I teamed up uh, to form. I was actually trying to get re Reflections on a Pond uh, shown in a number of different places, which we did, and then um, went to um, actually co-founding Artist Mentors Online, which started our my art chat journey doing these podcasts, and uh, met Joanna Arnett through Kevin, who's also uh, one of my mentors, and then through doing the art chats met George Gallo. So I actually look at those three individuals as being uh, a mentor to, to me. And uh, I think the rest of that's probably history. I think that took us up to where we are today, where I kind of live in this writing world and, and also this uh, visual artist world. Yeah, you do kind of live in both, which is really cool, because why not if, you, if that's what you're interested in, if that's what you can do. I like that you well, I, you venture out of just art. <laughs> well, exactly, and and there's a we're going to be actually interviewing next month Scott Burdick, who has done the exact same thing. Um, he is he's been painting. He's a well-established, well-known, wonderful artist, master artist, 
and uh, he just published a, no a uh, fiction novel as well. Uh, so it's we're probably going to talk a lot about that uh, next month as well, and, and Scott's journey and, and you know it, it's it's really kind of interesting because the more that I get to to interview and to know um, some of the master artists around, uh, they are always doing something uh, in addition to their art. Uh, like CW uh, Mundy has got an, a, a CD out there, and along with his art, and um, cool. George Gallo writes professionally. Uh, he has mm -hmm. you know, scripts. He's a screenwriter. Um, and directs and does different things, and then he also has his art, and so it's almost becoming, um, and maybe I feel like it's becoming more the norm than the abnormal because I'm in the same situation and just happen to notice it. But um, I think there, I think the, there's going to be this um, courage, I guess, taken on by a lot of a lot of folks to to go out and, and say, well, you know, why not? I can do this. Why, why don't I try to do this over here? The skills are basically the same. If you're marketing your art, you can market a book. I mean, it, the skills are there. It takes a while for you to build a platform. Everybody knows that. And the platform is people who are interested in you and, and what you're doing. And it takes a while to build that, no matter if you're doing fiction books or art instruction books or teaching art. And you need to, to build those relationships and network. I agree. Okay, um, let's see here. So you talked a little bit about the creative aspects of P&G, Procter & Gamble. Um, was your work at Procter & Gamble helpful to your art career at all? Um, yes and no. Yes is the... Um, P&G is huge on marketing. Um, and I wasn't in the marketing area, but um, I was actually in and product supply, product research, and then in a um, corporate capacity and support for uh, quality systems and things like that, um, and mostly in computers. So uh, building computer software, building computer programs. Uh, so that aspect has really been helpful because I've been able to construct my own websites, for example, and and mm -hmm. um, very you know very handy at coding different things. Um, so it, some new technology comes out, and I can you know, basically jump on board and, and have it figured out uh, in a while. Although that's getting harder and harder because I'm getting further and further away from doing. It. But so in one way, it happens that, or that's that's been very helpful. But P and G being a marketing company, you also, when I was managing projects, you also had to market your project to your directors and and above so that you could get funding and money to continue your project. If you didn't market it well, it didn't get funded, it got pushed by the wayside. Um, so you know, there was a lot of different um, aspects of marketing that you learned as being a project manager so that you could just continue to work um, on that project. And then naturally leadership skills and communication and networking skills um, you know, all come in handy when you're, you're doing this kind of work. And uh, also, you know, being able to read a contract <laughs> if, if one gets offered, you know, so um, that helps you think through things, you know, um, creative problem solving is, is also very helpful and one of the skills that P&G um, looks at as well. And, uh, you know, it just makes your business side, um, it, it's very helpful on the business side. I'm not particularly sure it's all that helpful when I'm painting a painting or, or actually writing a script. Organization skills, yes, um, and design skills certainly uh, go in there with that, but it's a different kind of organization when you're painting or writing in a different kind of organization um, and design, if you will, as well. So, But the critical thinking, I think, still remains the same, it, it, so it's pretty close. Okay, I'm impressed when you said earlier that you would come home on a Friday night and just write till three and <laughs> four in the morning, because I don't know how you'd have the energy to do that after working all week. Well, do you I, have any what, tips? <laughs> well, it's you know it's funny. People that don't like to do a certain thing, like you may not be a writer, so coming home and writing all night sounds like drudgery. Or mm -hmm. oh my gosh, how do you stay awake? Um, where for me, that's an adrenaline rush. Um, okay. You know, I, I, I do write every day, um, but it may not be writing 
uh, that you think of as far as like writing a book. But if I can set my best writing happens when I have an eight hour block of time set aside and that I can just say, okay, you know, I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to write and I'm going to write all day. And my best writing comes at that, that time. Um, a lot of folks advocate for, you know, write 2,000 words a day. My problem is if I write 2,000 words a day, the next day I'm spending my time cleaning up the 2,000 words that I <laughs> did before because my mind is so far ahead of where I, I want to be. So I've kind of always conditioned myself to take these huge blocks of writing time and, and, mm -hmm. and write. And the okay. same with painting. I, and it's, it's really strange because this carries over to my painting as well. If, if I'm going to schedule studio time, which I do, it's got to be at least four hours, or I I don't I can't get I can't get into the zone and really do what I need to do. So, it really is, you know, I, I'm excited about sitting down and writing for eight hours, or I'm excited about sitting down and painting for eight hours, um, and then I, I have a hard time uh, motivating myself for a short period of time, and that's just me, and that mm -hmm. may not work for anybody else out there. You know, other people may want you know, may want to paint for two or three hours a day and then do everything else. And that's fine. My, my um, response to that would be do what works for you. Um, and don't feel guilty if your, uh, your style or, or how you work is different than someone else. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I would be so excited about coming home and writing on Friday night that um, my room was always a mess. I had paper strewn everywhere. <laughs> My mom would walk up and like, clean this up, because I was living at home. Clean this room up. I'm like, I can't, because everything's <laughs> in its place. It, it looks like chaos, but it isn't. You know, that's this chapter, and that's that chapter. And so it was kind of funny um, from that standpoint. And it really was a mess. It, it, I still had to take an hour to find something, so it probably wasn't that organized. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Let's move on and talk a little bit about mentors. I know you know, or I know you think it's important to have a mentor. So maybe you can tell us um, why you think that's important, and then like what your mentors taught you. Okay. Um, Kevin was Kevin McPherson was my first mentor, and um, mm -hmm. well, I don't count Larry because Larry was an instructor, and um, that was probably at that point in time. Uh, was more of a hobby, uh, but Larry did teach me a lot. Um, and then Kevin had the hard job of uh, breaking every bad habit I developed <laughs> when I was a hobbyist. And um, I so bless his heart for putting up with me uh, and breaking those habits. Um, <laughs> it's he's uh, he, he I mean I can remember a conversation that I had with with Kevin on the phone because what what happened was you know Kevin would say okay I want you to go paint something uh, we would decide on what that something was and then I would go downstairs and paint it and then Kevin would critique it with me on the phone and some of these phone calls because Kevin was in New Mexico and I was in um, you know I'm in Ohio and some of these phone calls would last two three hours as we were going through these critiques and um, I remember one time uh, I was getting really, really frustrated because everything I was presenting him, he was tearing apart, and rightfully so. You know, now looking back, they were terrible. And um, I was like, you know, at one point I got like really frustrated, and I said, you know, I'm just trying to impress you. And he says, you want to impress me? Listen to what I'm saying. And I mean, we got into this argument, and it was really kind of, you know, the step forward because we allowed each other to talk to each other this way. Um, uh -huh. But I mean, I would not recommend talking to Kevin this way if you ever go to a workshop. But um, you know, because we were working so closely together and doing so many yeah. things, you know, business-wise, you know, we had this really nice relationship where we could, you know, really talk to one another and really just, you know, let the barriers down. And um, that, and he had, you know, like I said, he had his, he needed to break my bad habits, but he had to, he had to show me what those bad habits were first. And of course, you know, we all have that part of our ego that says, oh, I'm, you know, my stuff is great. I can put it up here next to Kevin's and it's going to shine just like Kevin's. And, you know, it doesn't. <laughs> and that's the hard thing to get over is, you know, there was so mm -hmm. much to learn. And, you know, you had to get, as George would say, you have to get your ego out of the way. And, you know, when I finally, when, he, when we finally had that heart-to-heart -heart discussion and, um, you know, he was, and he really had to tell me, and really had to make me see what was wrong. Um, from that point on, the mentoring got easier. 
because you know I realized you know it's like like you would say really seriously take a picture of one of my works and a picture of one of your works and set them side by side and you know really take a look at them put your ego aside and really take a look at them and you know part of that ego was developed at P&G because everything we do is right naturally in the business world <laughs> and um, and so you know I had to really you had to be really really strong with that at, at Procter and Gamble. So I really had to learn to step back and just say, you know, okay, you you got one of the best paint best painters, artists, master artists around who's willing to mentor you. Are you going to listen to him, waste his time, or are you going to, you know, really look at this and see what's going on? So mm-hmm. had to go through a little bit of self discovery that way, and then. Um, so Kevin was, like I said, had to put up with all the bad habits, and we finally broke that down, and um, you know, made a lot of progress seeing shapes, and um, you know, he he his focus is, was um, you know shapes and and values and um, color and uh, light and shadow and uh, different things, you know, contrast, different things like that. So it, it was a ton of new information coming at me. And I think it was so much information that it was just really, really hard for me to, I mean, these I'm talking about the years that I worked with Ken and I was struggling. And out of that relationship and that struggle, um, you know, I, I talked to Ken and I said, you know, I said, there's, there's an opening here to do something uh, with you mentoring online, try to do the same thing. So that's where Artist Mentors Online came from because mm-hmm. of his mentoring me. We had this, you know, between my business aspect of it and presenting it to folks and Kevin's knowledge, um, you know, while he was growing me as an artist, you know, we were growing others as artists too, and an artist mentors online. So, and that was um, that was that was really fun for you know a few years, <laughs> and then Kevin, you know, rightfully so as an artist, grew into something else that he wanted to do. With, I mean, he still would mentor me and stuff, but he he got really interested in China and moving to portraits and. Um, so there wasn't enough time for for everything, so that's why Artist Mentors Online kind of isn't around anymore. But um, a lot of good stuff came out of that. And then uh, about at the same time, because I just always love to make things harder on myself. About the same time that I met Kevin, I met Joanna Arnett through Kevin, because Joanna and Kevin are friends. And um, Joanna ended up becoming one of my mentors because I took a workshop with her, and we became instant friends. And um, she still is one of my mentors, uh, and she has a different approach in painting than Kevin does. Um, Kevin's um, or Joanna's has a, a lot of, at least with me, um, drawing you know input to you know you have to do this drawing, it has to be right, and you have to understand composition and um, things like that. So um, so that was a whole different area than where Kevin was focusing me on. So at the same time that I have Kevin mentoring me, I have Joanna mentoring me on the the drawing and and composition and and, uh, colors and and things like that too. So so like I said, I like to make it harder on myself to have two mentors telling me two different, totally different things, uh, but also trying to get me to get to the same spot. So, and then um, a few years later, uh, met George Gallo, and I loved George. Especially, you know, his very expressive color, his brush strokes, the thick texture. I loved all that. And I met George probably at the right time because I wanted to move away from um, not very much texture, very smooth type of painting to something very thick and very textured. And um, then that's when I also picked up my palette knife, and that's when I found my true voice. So. Some of the paintings that you're seeing here, like the one that's up here now, that um, it's going through a process of where I was breaking it down and building it up and breaking it down and building up. And the book actually talks about um, how I kept walking in, looking at this original painting that I had done of This is Respite, and uh, kept going, oh, wow, that stinks. <laughs> I really don't like that. Ugh, it's icky. You know, and it got to the point where I turned it around because I didn't want to look at it anymore. And I, one day I just got brave and said, well, let's see what I can do with this. Um, and you know, started asking compositional questions and uh, what did I like about it? What did I didn't like about it? What do I need to do? You know, and here's this big, huge canvas that I was using. I, it's, I can't, it says in the book what the size is, but um, it's probably like three foot by four foot, something like that. A canvas and and I had these itty bitty little boats <laughs> down down in one part of it and um, I was like 
well, the boat's my, my center of focus. Why don't I make those bigger? So that's the first picture that you saw was the actual painting as it is now with the bigger boats. And, and this is where I'm kind of deciding what it is I want it to do with, with the painting. And in that, I, I really struggled over that one. So where it ended up, I was, I was very happy with. So I, I share that process in the book um, and what I did in, in kind of a blog-like fashion. Okay, cool. Let's um, get into the book a little bit here. Um, we just had a question come in from Mary that I want to ask. It, she says um, she wants to know if you talk about how to load the palette knife and which areas to wipe off before applying the knife to canvas in your book. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about your book and, um, well, I guess maybe answer Mary's question and then we can get into some other things about the book. Okay. Say Mary's question again. I'm sorry. Um, she wants to know. I want to make sure I have it right. If you talk about how to load the palette knife and which areas to wipe off before applying the knife to canvas. Oh, okay. Um, I don't go deeply into that. Um, how to load the palette knife. I do in the the instruction series talks a little bit about it um, and shows. I, I usually just have um, the the paint on the edges, one edge of the knife. I, I don't use a whole flat part of the knife, so it's almost like I'm using a. If you think about it, as as like a tip of a of a brush, um, and I have a. Sometimes I'll cut it down so that I just have a roll of paint, and then very very uh, light handedly bring down that color so that ends up breaking underneath the color with it. I never scrape, I shouldn't say that, I'll never scrape an area off in preparation to put new paint down. Uh, if I do scrape it off, I don't do anything but lay it right back down so that I get more broken color. I don't know if that's making sense um, without a demonstration to show it. Um, but the way I hold my, my palette knife, it's very, very loose. As a matter of fact, I have gym shoes that have um, paint all over them because I drop my palette knives a lot more than I drop my brushes because I do hold them so loosely. And I kind of just allow the brush or allow the palette knife to um, move with the texture that's already on the canvas. So I'm not scraping things off and, and putting paint down uh, other than just to put the same down so that I get some kind of form of broken color, but I don't actually prepare an area for that. The uh, the course, the online course has videos and shows me actually painting uh, with palette knives, so that would probably answer Mary's question more than me trying to tell him how I'm doing it in a, in a verbal chat. chat. So okay. well, I don't know if that helped, Mary. Mary. If not, let me know. Yeah, you can write us a if response not, let us know if that helped. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what inspired you to write How to Paint from Brush to Palette Knife? Um, and then, uh, look, okay, we'll just start there. <laughs> okay, um, it, it's really kind of interesting because, uh, like I said, I had so much information being given to me so generously by so many people be between the art chats and my mentors. And um, I had to, to uh, try and, and get this into a process because I was asked to teach a, a weekly class and I wanted to get a, a process down and, and I did that. And then uh, I, I think Sarah was actually over um, working in the Artist Network or the, yeah, the Artist Network Online University part. And I approached Sarah, you know, saying, can I do a, a an online course on yeah. from painting from brush to palette knife and and Sarah was very supportive and said I think that'd be great so my husband and I went downstairs and uh, he had his camera and I, we set up all these lights and we filmed some videos and then I, I said well I want to add some things uh, to that so I wrote a guide that goes with the online uh, course and I had gotten so many um, responses about that guide being very very helpful that I decided to turn it into a book and um, then when I was when I offered it in pre-order, it was so successful. I mean, we had people ordering it a lot. A lot of people. I didn't say that right. For a writer, that was really bad. I had a lot of people <laughs> um, ordering the book, and I said, "Well, I just don't want to do this, you know, like 75-page guide." So I started to say, "Where can I expand things?" And that's when I started putting in the the information about marketing, and um, 
it just like I said, it, it ended up being 233 pages, and uh, you know, and, and over 175 illustrations. So, um, and I, the, the important thing that I wanted to to cover in there is I wanted to give as many examples as I could about how um, we, you know, how the process ends up working. And and one of the other reasons why I decided to write a book about it was my view with palette knife is maybe a little bit different than other people's. Use it, and it may not be. I don't know. I haven't talked to a lot of palette knife painters, but um, everything that we learned as artists, whether we talk to talk about um, using a brush or using a palette knife, everything that we um, learn, we can't forget just because we pick up a palette knife. And in other words, edges are important, and the reason why they're important is because they go. Uh, they, they allow you to travel around the painting in a certain way. If I look at Fetchin, his typical one hard edge that makes your eyes stop is the place he wants you to stop in the painting. And the rest of his edges are pretty much non-existent or at least your eye doesn't pick them up because they're done so beautifully. And, and typically his hard edge is right around, if it's a portrait, right around where the person's face is so that you stop and enjoy all of the color around that, you know, figure's face, or um, you know, a specific, the one where the lady's painting her fingernails. It's her whole face and their pose, but there's enough color uh, in an, in a, the same value that doesn't present an edge that ends up pulling your eye over and makes you start wandering around the painting. So it's it's very very, um, you know, edges are very very important. And there are so many times that I see folks, some folks, um, painting with palette knives that don't pay attention to edge. And so a part of me said, you know, I, I need to, to get out there and talk about how I think palette knives, sh you know, should be used and, and how I, my philosophy is with palette knife, which is that the viewer is, you know, should not be tipped off at all about how you uh, created the painting. Um, that's not what it's about. It's about transcendence. It's about beauty. It's about them experiencing the painting. And um, when I looked at that, along with palette knife, I want. I didn't. What I didn't want to happen was the viewer walk up the, uh, up and say, "That was created with a palette knife." What I want the viewer to walk up and say is, "Oh my gosh, this is beautiful. Let me stand here a while and and look at all this gorgeous work." you know, the beautiful colors and how I move around the painting and, you know, look at over here and look at over here and look at, you know, I don't want them just, you know, saying, oh, you know, start, stop with their with your eyes because hard edges is, is a start, stop. They'll, they'll start to move and you get a hard edge and you, you stop and then you get a hard edge and you stop. So um, they get tired very, very easily. And, and this particular painting um, is of a, where I stayed in France. And, um, an evening type painting, and I took this down to Isley uh, Gallery, and they have it on sale there. Um, they were, they represent represent me, and Doug Isley picked this up, and he was looking at it. He's all, you know, this is lovely, and he was talking, and never once said, you know, this was done with a palette knife. And and I finally said to him because I wanted him to know the difference that, you know, this was created with a palette knife, and and he looked at me, and he looked back at the painting, and just went back and forth with it, and said. There's no way this was created with a palette knife, and I said, "Yeah, it was." And he was he was, he was like lost. He he had no idea that I was a palette knife painter. Um, based on the paintings that I brought down, he thought that I painted them all with a brush. Um, so, kind of my philosophy. Some folks um, may agree with that. Some folks may not agree with that. It may be your style. It may not be your style. But that's that's where I came out with why I wanted to uh, come out with a book was to get what I think about the, the philosophy of painting with palette knives. Um, it's another tool in your toolbox and you should use all the tools that you have is, is another part of the philosophy. Cool, thank you. Uh, I agree with mm -hmm. you. <laughs> uh, <let's see laughs> thank <here>. you. <laughs> uh, you talk about the four pillars of painting. Can you tell us a little bit about that and describe your painting process? Okay, well, I think some of the pictures they were going through, you can see the painting process, but we, we can, I'll um, first talk about the four pillars. And again, those four pillars come back to uh, drawing, composition, value, and color. And 
Um, basically, the more time you spend in the first three, the drawing, the composition, and the value, the more fun adding color will be and the better chance you have at making a, a painting that people will become interested in, in, in experiencing. Um, so we start with each pillar. Uh, drawing, for example, we have to get the drawing correctly. Um, we have to get it correct. I typically encourage uh, my students to start with um, the grid method or the rule of thirds so that we can get the drawing and the proportion and the perspective and, and all of that correct before we move on to anything else. We'll start in your sketchbook. We transfer it to Canvas um, using the grid method or the rule of third method, and we stick to that. And um, your one of the things that one of the conversations that Joanna and I have had is how your eye gets out of practice. Uh, if and also another friend of mine, artist, um, how your eye gets out of practice if you're not practicing drawing. So if I haven't been in my studio for a while and I'm going to start something new, I spend a lot of times, you know, just drawing this thing on a grid in my in my sketchbook, turning it upside down, making sure I can get my eye back into to proper proper proportion or whatever you want to call it that actually sees the mistakes. And um, you know, I may draw it once or twice, and then I'll do a value study in my sketchbook. I'll go upstairs and I'll make a copy of of um, of that particular sketch that I've done, and then take um, some of the prism color gray marking pens and I'll start playing with value, where I want the light to come in, what what are some interesting effects with that. And I may do three or four of those. And this is before I even get to the canvas. So I've spent, you know, a number of hours, if not days, figuring out, you know, all of the areas where they may be something wrong uh, with the drawing. And and over those hours and different times that I do this, I'm getting in my head, you know, what this looks like. So I can almost draw it in my sleep. <laughs> basically. Um, and even with doing all that, I still end up finding mistakes as I get further down, but fewer of them. And then I go in, and I, you know, after I get this drawn out and I start playing with the value, I start looking at the different compositions. And is there anything else I want to change in the design? Again, this is before I go to the canvas, so that when I'm ready to stand in front of my canvas, I'm ready to put down the exact design that I have in my sketchbook. Um, so now my photograph is there for uh, color reference. Uh, I, I do mostly studio painting. Um, if I do plain air painting, the, the difference I do something a, a bit different, different with that. But um, then I transfer my drawing to the canvas, um, and this process is um, covered in the From Brush to Palette Knife course. We transfer to this is actually putting in. Um, this isn't grayscale, this, but I, I put in a grayscale uh, value study. This is actually after the one step after the grayscale while I'm putting in foundation colors. And when I get to working, the grayscale value study I do with a brush. Um, and then when I get to the point where I start laying on colors, when I pick up my palette knives, and I've got probably 14 to 16 different shaped palette knives. Um, but it's really interesting because I only end up using about four or five of them that have become my favorite. And at uh, this particular stage, this is actually starting to get into uh, the building stage because there I can see a couple areas where the paint's uh, a little bit thicker and textured. But um, my foundation colors, we talk about just laying those down as smooth as we possibly can um, without any texture. And then we come back and start to build the painting with texture and with broken color. Um, and then that's the fourth stage, and and the color and um, the color that I'm mixing ends up being in the same sh value stage, value area, value range, range. That's the word. <laughs> Sorry, the value range that is um, I have laid down in the black and white grayscale value study. So uh, constantly, you know, looking through a red square and checking myself as I'm mixing things up and holding the palette knife up you know, to make sure that my values are the same so that I'm laying the color down exactly the way in it, the value pattern should be. And earlier you saw some, like, there was a picture of Tessa, who's my niece, um, a black and white picture, and then the color picture, and that's to show you that, you know, it was very close to my value scale 
that I had used, my value plan that I had used for her, and there's a couple other ones in here as well. So there's a lot of work that goes into those first three pillars, but once I have that work done and once I have that in my mind, um, I'm, I'm ready to start dealing with color because when you add color, you're adding a whole new, um, another whole step in the process that uh, so many variables can come in and or so many um, errors can be made. So once you have that, those three foundation pillars done and you come in to add the, the foundation color, you're at the point where you've probably painted it in your mind a couple times, at least I have, so I know exactly what color I want where. And um, it's it just seems like a more successful for me uh, process to do. And it kind of it gave me a way to organize everything that was thrown at me and paralyzed me um, back when I was developing my skills. And <clears throat> there, you know, we all go through that that frustrating time when we do develop our skills. But um, you know, at some point we all internalize that and, and make some kind of process out of it. And that's basically what I did with the four pillars is, you know, as, as just say drawing is important, composition and design is important, values and holding your colors to those values are important. And, you know, adding the colors that really, you know, strike the eye and, and broken color and, you know, it's all part of representational painting. And so uh, this is the real, this is... <laughs> Yeah, this is the um, respite again, and I think that's the when I had the um, longest dimension in the horizontal before I flipped it up and, and repainted it. It just ugh, still don't like it, but anyway. The, so that's that's what the four pillars are, and and the painting process. This is the grayscale study that I would start out with, and it's really kind of funny because at this point I should have actually seen that what I was trying to do wasn't going to work. Um, but I didn't. It's how you learn. <laughs> you just continue to try and trial and error is how we learn. We'll skip past this one. There you go. Well, that's not any better. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So this is what this is the ick that I um, did. I mean, I didn't didn't like the sky. I didn't like how small the boats were. Everything um, was just too choppy. Um, I had this storm thing going on in my mind, but I, it wasn't coming out the way I wanted it to come out, and um, I just I didn't like it. They're drawing mistakes that I can see in here right now, and um, you know, like I said, I, I would come in and, and just turn it. I would go Ugh, and just turn the thing around and not do anything, and um, I basically chided myself one night and said, you know, okay, well you can sit there and turn it around, but you still know it's there, so you're going to have to do something with this, and. Um, that's when I decided that I would go to the next um, next level with this and and really get brave and turn it so that my longest dimension was in the, the long in the uh, vertical and, and not horizontal um, to try and give it more uh, depth and and more um, feeling of how big the mountains are and the boats are being a little bit bigger too as, because they're closer. Okay. Um, I just want to remind everyone that they can type their questions into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. And I just saw this really good question from Tina, and I think it probably came in when you were talking about um, your mentors, but I just saw it, so my apologies, Tina. Uh, the question is, so what was the most important advice that you received as an artist? Who? Um, yeah, can you just name that one thing that was like kind of changed everything, <laughs> shifted the way you think, or... I think it's a great question. <laughs> yeah, I think the consistent thing that I heard from Kevin, from Joanna, and from George um, mm -hmm. was, you know, really get your ego out of the way and really look mm -hmm. at your work. Uh, uh, because, I, you know, we could go on forever and ever thinking that we're painting wonderful paintings and we're not. And, um, you yeah, know, because our ego says, you know, hey, I spent six hours on this. This has got to be a wonderful painting. And I kind of ran into this the other day with um, my one of my students in my class. And, um, you know, it, it's hard to hear, you know, that, that painting is not very good. Um, and here's the reasons why. And, you know, for you to put your egos aside and accept that is it, really hard to do. But once you do that, the learning that that happens and the the... It's almost a, it almost becomes a freeing 
experience because um, I guess I kind of I kind of said to Kevin something about um, you not making mistakes. I didn't want to make a mistake or or something around that type of thing and. Um, it, it's too, you know, this stuff is too hard to learn or something. And I remember having a conversation with Joanna about it the same way and, um, you know, the same same type of conversation. And it wasn't whining. You know, I wasn't whining. It was just that I was losing confidence. And, you know, it, as I set my ego aside, losing the confidence was part of it. I was like, I wasn't confident that I could paint. I wasn't confident that I could continue on the journey. And um, that I think the, the, you know, they were my mentors were really great because they kept saying we wouldn't be doing this if you didn't have the, the ability to paint. We wouldn't be sitting here, you know, helping you the way that we're helping you if we didn't see it in you. And mm -hmm. so their confidence was fine. <laughs> my confidence wasn't all there. And um, so it was really interesting that I, that whole, I mean, and this wasn't something that, you know, it wasn't I woke up one morning and my ego was out of the way. You know, that, that didn't happen. Uh -huh. um, it was. You know, it happened over, you know, maybe six months to a year. That um, every time that I thought I painted a great painting, uh, it wasn't. And then, um, so I guess the the big thing is is if you sign up for a workshop uh, with someone, um, go there open enough to listen and to learn from them. Don't go in thinking that you know you're going to be the star student. Um, or thinking that you're going to impress them, um, because you know we're talking about people that hang around with other master artists, and they're really hard to impress. Number one, um, number two, that's not why you're there. Um, they can be impressed all they want. It isn't going to help you sell. It isn't. <laughs> they aren't going to, you know, become your best buddy and and tell you all the secrets of the world. Although they generously tell you a lot of the secrets of the world of painting anyway. But you know, they're they're there's you're there to learn from them so try as much as you can to get your ego out of the way be explorative um, ask the questions paint the way they're telling you to paint even if you can't do it try it um, because you'll end up with more responses for them from them and more help from them uh, if they genuinely see you struggling to do what they're asking you to do um, mm -hmm. so I guess from my years of being mentored that's probably the the best advice that I can give because it was and the most memorable part because it was just really really hard to to get that ego out of the way to hear that I wasn't a impressing them and B I didn't know what I was doing so um, yeah that was that was probably the hardest time and the best advice that was given to me because I mean they really certainly could have said you know what you're on you're on trainable bye <laughs> but they stuck with me so um, that was a good thing. Always the dang ego. <laughs> Out of my way. I know. It, you know, I know. I know. And, you know, it's... Mm, that's great advice, though. Don't I mean, go in with expectations. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's good life advice there. Um, okay, so I'm wondering, do you consider yourself an artist, author, or I know you use the word creative entrepreneur a lot, so... Where do you fall on that, and what's the difference in it all? Okay. Um, if you had asked me this question in 2005, I would have told you I'm an artist. And if you have asked me a question <laughs> two years ago, I would have told you that I'm an artist and an author. Because a lot of the information... I, I built the Artist Mentors Online website and wrote the blogs, and um, you know, Kevin did the mentoring and uh, created the lessons and um, all the business side was basically handled by me and my husband uh, who, who was our financial guy and um, then Kevin you know, was there to mentor and instruct and um, so when Artist Mentors Online was around I would have told you that I'm an author and an artist because I'm writing all this content and then um, you know then I wrote the book, so yes, I would have been saying I'm an author and an artist. And then I started to think about creative entrepreneur because I ran into Joanna Penn, who is a creative entrepreneur, and mm, a, yeah, a number of yeah. other. Basically, the, you know, this whole year we've done nothing but talk to people that I consider are creative entrepreneurs. Scott Burdick's mm -hmm. a creative entrepreneur. Joanna Arnett is a creative entrepreneur. 
um, Kevin uh, McPherson is a creative entrepreneur. Um, and basically the, the difference comes in is you're not putting yourself in a box and saying, I'm an artist, I have to stay an artist. I, I can only do what you know artists do. Well, what do artists do? They market, they paint, they explore, they learn, they create. Um, if you look at Karen Wentworth, um, who we had on last year or last month, you know she creates baggage tags with her art and seed bags, and you know she has so many different things going on where she's getting her art out there. And um, Sarah and I were kind of talking about this before in the green room before we came on the air, and it, it's kind of it's a, it's a new trend. It's as education for art goes down in the schools and only those who who want to passionately create or become artists our audience our collectors our people who we have to market to are going to be not as informed as our generation was informed if they have an interest in it they're going to become an artist um, some may be become collectors but that that big you know like when I went to school art was taught from grade school all the way through high school and an appreciation for art um, came out of that that teaching. Certainly in grade school, in high school it was more of an elective. Um, and then if you were really really good in high school, your art teacher, you know, prompted you to go to an art college and and get a degree in in art. So we're we're losing that. We're losing a lot of that. And that's why I think you see a lot of the ateliers being created. Um, and a lot of folks going from high school into an atelier because they're getting more of the drawing skill and, and instructions that they need uh, to create a really great career as a fine art artist. But I keep seeing and I keep hearing that the collectors of fine art are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And um, you know, if you think about what kids today are seeing as art, Think about all the animation that they see. Yeah, they're just raised on completely different media in general. Right, and you know, if these kids ever hear about Monet, it's going to be through a video game. It's, you know, it's yeah, not going to be so through crazy. their school. Okay, so yeah. you know, and this isn't just going to affect artists. I mean, we had, I was having this discussion with another artist the other day. Mm -hmm. This isn't just going to affect artists. The generation after. Well, two generations after us, I guess, they're going to grow up and wonder what the heck a museum is. I don't, you know, I don't see a lot of kids going to these museums. I don't see a lot of education happening around the old masters and things like that. At least in my area, I don't. If it happens in your area, I, I, please tell me. I'm, I'm, I'd be really happy. Um, but you know, I see a lot of interest. The uh, younger generation, the generation about two generations behind me. So my great nieces and um, great nephews, um, you know, they're watching video games. Their whole world is, I want to be a, you know, video game designer. I want to make this animation type of thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's that's just the way the technology is. But I just really think that museums are going to have a hard time staying open and um, unless we start getting back to teaching some fundamental art education. And you start talking about that, you know, what's being cut in school these days? Music, art, you know, writing. Some schools aren't even teaching cursive anymore. So, you know, that's I'm kind of the advocate for we need to get this stuff back in the schools because I think it, it it's you know whenever I hear somebody say that, you know, art does not do anything for critical thinking. Mm. You know, I'm gonna be like that Batman, you know, <laughs> this Batman things on Facebook where the Batman slapping Robin. And that's what I feel like because it's like yeah. <laughs> you know, there's math that comes into this. You start talking about critical thinking and design. You start talking about you know all this other stuff that we were talking about this whole talk, and um, it, you know it's just I just kind of sit there and look at them and think I can't talk with people who don't understand this <laughs> because I get too passionate and um, you know we as artists I think we owe it to um, whoever we meet in the younger generation to to kind of uh, bring them under your wing a little bit and provide some education and talk to them about different things. I've done that with a couple of my nieces and you know one, every time she sees me of course she wants to be an artist and then um, every time that I see her 
talking with another aunt, <laughs> you know, I want to be what this aunt is. But, you know, at least we're making an impression on them and, and hopefully they'll have some, some interest. Uh, but yeah, so so now I, getting back to the question, that was a long guy I tried, but um, getting back to the question, I see myself more as a, a creative entrepreneur because I don't want to put myself in a specific box. I don't want to be, um, I don't want to tell myself that I'm just an artist and I'm just going to go over and do just artist things. Um, if I did that, I would never have written how to paint from brush to palette knife. Um, at the same token, I right. don't want to just write art books. I want to write fiction books as well. So um, then I you know, put myself, okay, now I'm an author. So if I'm a creative entrepreneur, I just open the box and say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. <laughs> and you know, people will like it or people won't like it. And um, I'm not that focused on what people are going to like and, and what people aren't going to like. Um, I think we're going to have uh, some, you know, I think I, I want to be happy and I want other people to be happy. And I guess my big thing is by putting myself and telling, calling myself an entrepreneur, a creative entrepreneur, I'm in a position better to uh, make myself happy. I love that. I just love that you do so many different things. Um, that made me think of another question here is when you go to kind of market these things, um, how do you handle, like, do you find that your audience kind of meshes nicely and that they're maybe interested in both your writing and your art, or do you find some people are only interested in one or the other, and how do you kind of handle marketing and managing, like, the different audiences for the different things that you do? Um, probably the answer is not very well. <laughs> I don't think I handle it very well. It seems challenging. That's why I'm curious. <laughs> um, yeah, it is a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And there is an, you know, it's one of these things where, uh, and Allison Stanfield said when we had an art talk with her earlier in the year, back in March this year, um, she was talking about uh, um, newsletter subscribers. Real quickly mm -hmm. on, a, on a marketing standpoint, um, yeah, Facebook is great, uh, but it, it, you can get all the likes in the world, it, it, but it's not going to translate to a sale. Most yep. of the time. And the other thing, Facebook is making it harder and harder on people every day, and to me, it's not even worth keeping up with all their changes anymore to utilize the site. Right. I mean, basically, if you want to get something, this is this is the thing you have that to pay that always to get your business. Yeah. And even then, it's not going to um, it's not it's not going to do you any good because, <laughs> for example, I watch I look at Facebook. I'm, I'm on my computer. I have Firefox. And on part of Firefox has add-ons, and the add-on that I have up is ad blocker. I see no ads when I'm on Facebook. So you just, I, you know, I've done this. I have paid ads. Um, I don't pay a lot. I don't pay more than ten dollars because I know it's, you know, it's not going to be worth it for Probably me. Probably not going to reach people, yeah. Right, because everybody else who has Firefox has their ad blockers on. We never see the ads in our newsfeed. Never. I never see an ad from Facebook. So I know there's a percentage. Of getting that. <laughs> Tech-savvy people out there that are that. Hmm? What? I'm sorry. Oh, I said I'll be getting. What did you that. say, Sarah? I don't have I that add-on. Oh. Yeah, and, and so you know you don't see the see the ads. So Facebook is not the way to go if you really want to reach people. Okay. If you really expect to get some kind of conversion to, to um, you know have them buy something. Uh, the next next thing you know, Twitter and all that. Okay. Your feed is only available on Twitter. Or your, whatever you just tweeted out will only be live for seven seconds. After that, it's going to be so far down in the chain, nobody's going to see it. So unless that's you have actually a, really reassuring because I tweet a lot of dumb stuff sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I have my Facebook feed set up to go to my Twitter feed, so whatever I post in Facebook perfect. goes automatically to Twitter, so I don't that's spend perfect. a lot of time there. And um, <laughs> and basically, the, the the only time that Twitter helps you is if you have a network of people who are willing to retweet what you tweet it because then mm -hmm. you start to get some trending and you get thrown into a Twitter al algorithm that says, hey, you know, 5, 10, 15 people retweeted this, so we need to let this kind of live a little bit longer. So you get 10 seconds instead of 7. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, so... How nice. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, and then, by the way, the Facebook news feed, you get 20 seconds of life before people will stop seeing them on the feed. Wow. So again, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you're like sitting here for hours, right, doing Facebook and nobody's responding. Well, that's, that's the reason why. It's, the life on Facebook is 20 seconds in the news feed and the life on Twitter is seven. So, um, so those two things, you know, yeah, do it because 
you, you what net what I use Facebook for is networking, is staying in touch with people. Mm-hmm. So then, what 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 can I do that's going to give me something better? And and that's newsletters, uh, because okay, if you send a newsletter. Hopefully people are on your list because they opted into your list. Don't ever buy an email list uh, because nothing ticks me off more than me getting an email from somebody that I don't know about what they're doing. So don't just go out and go, I'm going to buy, and I have so many people that have me, I am on so many lists that this happens to me every week. And the first thing I do, I don't even read it. I go in and unsubscribe. It's like I didn't ask to be on this list. Uh, so, you know, I whoop, kick myself out of it. So. So newsletters is your be- are your best with people who opted in to your newsletter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other part, it still comes down to word of mouth. And, um, you know, I, I've built a lot of relationships out on, on Facebook uh, who are on my newsletter. Uh, a lot of those relationships that I've built out on Facebook have turned into what I call conversions or what they call conversions um, that have actually bought the book. Um, either blind influence or how to paint. And um, the other thing that, you know, face-to-face is the other thing that is great. So um, when I go out to do a book signing and a book talk, I walk away with sales every time that I am out talking face-to-face to to people. I walk away with a sale. And that's on the book side. Um, On an art side, your exhibitions and shows are very, very important. But because we're talking about so much more money for a painting, it may not necessarily convert to sales, but it, it is a point for you to network at the point, at some point, hopefully, that relationship you're building with the person that comes in and talks to you about your art will result in a sale later on. Um, there's, I've been kind of looking at the different numbers and stuff on the site, how many times people come to the site and, and how, how many times that it actually results in a sale. And there is a word of um, mouth type of thing out there that I've seen where people basically have said you have to get 250 people to come to your site, your website, or to a show or, or something like that before you get one sale. And that's a little bit lower for books, but it's pretty, it's pretty true that after 150 clicks to my website, I'll see a sale. Or 250 clicks to my art website, I may see an art sale. So wow. that's a lot of that's a lot of people that you need to engage. So the, the thing that you need to think about is is you know how can you engage more people so that the more people that you get engaged in what you're doing results in a quicker sale. So if I have, you know, 10,000 people coming to my site to look at it, you know, divide 10,000 by 250 and you know that's how many possible sales you may have and sometimes the number goes higher it all depends it, it, a lot of it comes down to price point too is, is what your price point is um, I always you know somebody asked me how my book sales are going I always kind of chuckle and laugh and say well it's going better than my art sales but look at this price difference we're talking 1295 <laughs> for a paperback versus you know, right, right. 500 a thousand depending on the size two thousand three thousand dollar painting so yeah, yeah. Um, have you heard or looked into Patreon much at all? Um, I've heard of it. I haven't looked into it yet. Have you? Um, I've I've seen some people using it. I haven't really looked into it from a user perspective. But it's um, for those of you who don't haven't heard of it, it's basically um, an online service that you can sign up for, and then people can give you money kind of for your creative content that you're producing on the internet. So. I was just kind of thinking if people are making like um, videos or even if you're putting together like information and stuff that you're giving away for free or at a really low cost but as someone like it's perfect for creative entrepreneurs and people that are putting content out there but aren't necessarily getting the monetary you know rep or whatever they would be getting paid to do that somewhere else you know but mm-hmm. for the time and so I think you can do like different packages and stuff like that and so I don't know how it would necessarily apply to your work, but it could be cool for folks out there that are kind of 